Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Change on the Run podcast, where we discuss common change challenges and ways to address them when you're short of time. And I'm your host, Phil Buckley. Today's topic is joining a team. Team membership is dynamic, especially during change. Often we're asked to join new or established groups with little notice. Getting to know all members might seem like a given, yet most people don't do it. They stay in their comfort zone of people they already know or reach out only as needed. Integrating yourself into a team is a skill worth mastering. The sooner you connect with other members, the faster you'll get up to speed, collaborate, and influence how the project manages the transition. So how do you join a team in a way that forms connections that foster relationships, collaboration, and contribution? And my guest today is Jennifer Waxman. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Hi, Phil, really happy to be here. Thanks for being on. Jennifer has 20 years of human resources and best practices HR research experience in the retail, information technology, and consulting industries. She is currently the Director of HR Research and Advisory Services at McLean & Company. Jennifer holds a Master of Industrial Relations, Human Resources Management from the University of Toronto and a BA from Western University. Jennifer, what's been your experience with joining teams during change? I've had a fair bit of experience joining teams during change. So, I mean, we join teams all the time in our lives, and it could be in our organizations, it could be in our jobs, it could be in our personal lives. And I think about my kids joining sports teams, going to a new school. When it comes to during change, I've done it as both a lead being brought on to a project as a change lead. And I've also been involved in change when organizations are, for example, restructuring and, and coming in and being on the receiving end of that and figuring out, you know, how to, to manage that. There's lots of experiences that we have in our lives in terms of joining teams, especially during change. It's something so common, but, but there's so little literature on it about how do you join to successfully integrate. And I'm just wondering, why is it so difficult for you or for me or for the listeners to join a new team when going through some form of transition? Especially during transition, emotions run high. You don't know what's going to happen. And you don't know what to expect from people. And change makes people uncomfortable. Especially nowadays, I think about, you know, us going through this pandemic, there's so much change going on. And we just have to learn to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's really important because how we feel about a change, it's going to vary throughout, sometimes we'll be totally accepting of it and the next will be totally opposed to it. So I think it's difficult to join a team, especially during change, because if you're new to a team, you don't have those relationships. And it's really important to have those relationships, to be able to build trust, to know who has your back. And so you need some time to do that. And when things are changing and tensions are high and people are unsure, it's harder to, to do that. It's so dynamic and, and you don't have those relationships like the, the glue that, that's going to bond you. And given sort of that speed of change and okay, now we're with a team. And, and I found that since speed is, is sort of the currency of change, the, those, those natural mm-hmm. abilities to, to connect and share kind of go out the window. Have you had that experience where like that, that social time is zero? Yeah, when uh, just kind of have to come in and and hit the ground running. Think about going through a back and at the beginning of my career, going through an acquisition. Uh, the company that I was with was acquired, and it, it was my first job out of school. And we were being acquired by a, a U.S. based company, and you had to get things done. You didn't know who you were dealing with. You were talking, and especially in that case, we were talking with people over the phone. We didn't use video conference at that time. <laughs> so it wasn't even face to face. So, you know, you're trying, you're being told you have to get this done and, you know, you've got to provide them information. You don't know anything about these people. They don't know you. And, and it was really quite nerve wracking. And especially being on the receiving end of the acquisition, we didn't know, you know, I didn't know what kind of role was going to be there for me in the future as well. So it was very stressful. That's such a great example of, 
not knowing anyone and you, you just have to get things done and, and you don't have the visual cues because it's on a conference call or a start call that used to be so yeah. popular and progressive for the mm-hmm. time. <laughs> and what do you pick up when you're on those calls, given that change is so emotional? How do you know if you're making a connection or not just based on what you hear? I found in that particular situation, just the fact that you could have the one-on-one calls with the individual. So you could actually, like, yes, you had to get things done and there were certain time frames. But when you're dealing with someone one-on-one, you can actually take that time to connect with them. And, you know, at the beginning of a call, talk more personally and you don't have to jump right into business, especially, you know, in, the, in an acquisition state, you're having to share information. And so taking some time to share a little bit about yourself, to get to know the other person, and you're talking to oftentimes the same person a lot. So then you start to over time build that relationship. It takes a little bit of time, but you could be speaking to them multiple times in a day. So you get a little bit of time there. And especially in an acquisition where if you don't know what your role is, potentially the people that you're speaking with could be the ones that get the role or or the preferred role going forward. How do you manage that dynamic? Because the person on the phone or these days on, on Zoom or Teams could be your competitor. That is definitely a tough one. And I think, you know, when you're trying to manage through that, I definitely think leveraging your relationship with your own manager is helpful. In a change, communication is so key. I know we always talk about that in change management, how critical communication is. And leaders and managers play such an important role in that and helping employees to feel better about a change. So, you know, really engaging with your manager to understand and as much as they know to share with you about what the impact is going to be for you to understand who you should be connecting with the networks that you should be building, you know, how you can leverage your knowledge and your skills and connecting with people on the other side, even using maybe that connection that you have with that person to understand who those other people are out there on the team that you could start building relationships with so that they can get to know you. And I'm wondering from your experience, when either you've joined a a team and and the team is well established, or you've just observed people coming into a team, why do you think that the established teams might be a bit resistant to the new person coming in and her, his ideas and what's going on there? Because if we can understand the dynamic, then perhaps we've got the information to mitigate that resistance. What's your perspective? Good question. And I think that trust is really such a core piece of of building a strong team. And teams that have worked together, especially for long periods of time, they know each other, they're used to doing things a certain way. And they may come in themselves with some preconceived ideas of what this new person is going to do. Are they going to come in and start questioning how we've been doing things all along, which is why, you know, the when you join a team, you really have to think about how you're going to engage with those people. So trust is so critical. Effective teams, they need to be open and they need to be honest, and they need to be able to feel vulnerable with each other. And so that's why the trust piece is so important. It's hard to be vulnerable if you don't trust one another. They're going to need time to get to know that new person. And the new person is going to need to get to know them and how they work together and how they can communicate with each other. It's interesting. I was having a conversation the other day with a colleague of mine, and I was talking to her about when she joined our team. And she was saying, It is really important, yes, about the person who's coming in to the team, making sure that they get to know people and understand what motivates them and and to listen. But she said it's equally important that the people on the team be open and inclusive of that new person and really think about how they can bring that new person in. I think it's important that those team members and the manager of those teams think about that, about how they are going to bring that new team member into the fold and not go in with those preconceived ideas of what the new person might try to do when they come in. Just given that example, were there any suggestions of how do you onboard someone to a new team? What are those requirements to make sure a person feels connected or are there along a path to start building the trust and the relationship they need to be successful? Something that we do at McLean, like when we hire new people, when we onboard them, we actually make a point as part of our onboarding that they meet with everybody on the team. That is really important. And they meet one-on-one. And you can't do that on every single team, but the key people that they're going to have to meet with, make sure that in the beginning that they have those one-on-one connections. And managers play a really special role in building those networks for new people. Figuring out who on the team, the immediate team, but also who on the larger team 
those individuals need to connect with and helping that new person to reach out and to connect with those individuals and to kind of set up, um, you know, what is the purpose of the meeting? Why are they meeting with each other to help them to start building those relationships so that they're not just coming in there. It's not just a, hi, how are you? There actually is a purpose and intention to the meeting. What do people need to know when they are going in with that list of things that will help them make a connection? Well, I think understanding the culture of that team is really important. How those individuals work together, what's the feedback that you're hearing? If, I, if you're already in the organization, it's a little easier to get this kind of information. You know, what's the feedback around this team and how they work with each other or how they work with others? Are they an inclusive team? Do they collaborate? Are they welcoming? Or are they the kind of team that's more competitive and they tend to like to do things on their own or not open to others coming in? So I think where you can, either getting some feedback you know, if you're literally a new person coming in from outside the company, leveraging any networks that you might have within the organization or even externally with LinkedIn, sometimes you can see who those individuals are connected with and you may have common connections. So use those to help understand a little bit more about those individuals and really understand what motivates them. So that's an important thing. What, what motivates these individuals? What are their work styles and how do they like to communicate with each other or be communicated with? All great ones. And I find that every team almost has a shorthand. They have their own jokes and in shared experience. How do you figure that out? Because it again, it's like, you know, everyone's laughing and you're kind of looking around as the new member going, I, I know it's funny, but I, I don't know why. One thing that's nice to do is to try to find that one person on the team and that person, like your body almost, that who can be that connection for you that you can go to with questions that you may have to understand like what I heard this, you know, acronym used and I don't know what it means. So that person can help you. So if you can find and, and build a relationship, you know, in some cases with a new hire, sometimes the organization will assign you a buddy. Other times you may have to figure that out on your own. But if you can find that one person that you feel you can connect with, that person can help guide you. Have you ever experienced someone, they were entering a team and they didn't do well and it compromised their ability to contribute. Maybe it had compromised the total team success, but how they approached it didn't work. And perhaps if you could share a story and, and also what did they do that caused the negative outcome to happen? One company that I worked at, there was an employee who was promoted and that individual, when they, went, when they went into that new role, they changed a lot in terms of the way they interacted with people. They spend a lot of time very much focused on building the relationships with the businesses they supported, but what they neglected was their own team. And so even though it was a role that, you know, it was more of a business partner type role where you spend a lot of time supporting a business, you still have your own team of others like you that work together. And usually you act as sounding boards and support to one another. And so this individual came in really focused on the business side and neglected building the relationships with internal team. This individual is really focused on doing their own thing, isolated themselves to a certain extent from the rest of the group, just focused on their own things and didn't really engage with the rest of the team, either professionally or socially. That person really was not considered a part of that team. You know, really kind of, you could, you could sense it from the team that that person's really isolated themselves and so the, that person's team perceived them as really being focused on their own interests and not really interested in being a member of the team. I think it was a myth or a loss for everyone because then the person who's isolated themselves doesn't have the support if things get tough for them. They don't have anyone to go to and another thing is that when especially when you're supporting businesses you've got a team you usually try to do things either similarly or bounce ideas off each other so it could create other issues for other parts of the business or rework for people. And you also just lose the ability to share ideas and learn and grow. Both sides of the team really lost out on that by this person deciding to more to themselves. Isn't it interesting that whole self-interest perception, whether it's true or, or not, but if, if you do perceive someone is just out for themselves and not for the team, you one, you have the emotional response, but also you have a triggered defensive response as well. And any advice you have for the listeners to, to flip that? So you're entering a team and the last thing you want is to come across as someone 
who is only interested in him or herself. And any things that you've done in the past yeah. or, or that you could recommend? So uh, it was actually interesting. At one company I was at, I was asked to lead a change, to be the change lead. It was an organization-wide project. We were going to be launching a new technology to replace manual processes. And this was going to be launched to all employees across the country, probably like tens of thousands of employees that were going to have to change the way that they were doing things. And there was a project team that was already in place. There were business partners already in there. You know, IT is working on this, finance is working on this. There were different business partners that were in there that had already started working on this because it's a new technology. So they already had to figure out how is the process going to change? What was the technology going to do? And so they'd been working together and I then had to come in a little bit later. And I was saying, well, I'm supporting the people side of this because they weren't really thinking about the people side. And so it was interesting. I joined the team. They were introduced to me. We all, we all met each other. And then I found that meetings kept happening and I wasn't getting invited to them. And I'd find out about them after the fact. And then I started looking at, I'd be going to book meetings and I see these meetings and calendars. I hadn't been invited to them. And I, and I was finding it really hard, especially when I was trying to figure out what the change project or what the change plan was going to be. I, at the beginning, I'm trying to do all the gathering of like, what is this change and what's the purpose and why are we doing this? And so really what I did was I made an effort of getting to know each person individually. So connecting with them one-on-one, -on -one, whether it was in person or over the phone, and learning more about them and their, their role on the project and what they were trying to achieve, what was their goal. Then it gave me an opportunity to then say to them, you know, oh, if there's any meetings, reminding them, I'm here, I really would like to be included in these, I really need to be included in these, and this is why. If I saw meetings in their calendars, I could reach out and say, hey, do you mind, can you please add me to this invite so that I can join? So then they started doing that, and then I was able to also show them, like, explain my role, and then start to deliver, you know, what I needed to do from a change perspective and start showing them the information that I was gathering and how it was going to support the work that they were doing and how with this, the overall success of the system implementation. It was great because by the end of the project, we were very close to the project team. We would have, you know, we'd have a war room and we'd sit together in there as things were rolling out and really supporting one another through the change because it was a big change and we were rolling it out in pace. So I found that really, it, it helped, but I had to get to know them one-on-one -on -one and really show, understand what they needed and how I, what I was bringing to the table could help them and help the project succeed and be able to show them that. Something you mentioned that, that I find too, that being on tens and tens of, of these large projects and that some of the best and closest friendships and relationships I've had have been in the war room and you spend so much time together. And why do you think that is? Because they're, they're highly intense times. They're often pressurized. They can be stressful. But I always remember back fondly about the bonds within the mm -hmm. team. What's going on in there? I think there's something about having to work through a challenge together that really builds those bonds. You can't do it on your own. You have to work together as a team. And you're all going through it. You're all experiencing it together. You're all supporting one another through it. And so it really does help to forge those strong bonds. It's so fascinating. It's the reliance on each other. And how do you build that into the, that integration on a team? Because I think it's a huge insight that you can't do it alone. It's going to be the, your ability to work together that will lead to everyone's individual successes as well as the teams. But I, I don't think we always go into the team thinking that way. How do you kind of harvest almost that knowledge so that you can integrate well within to teams? Do you have any thoughts about that? That's a good one. I was thinking about this the other night and I was thinking, you know, of the, the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team yeah. by Patrick Lencioni. The one thing that really resonated with me from that book was about how in order for a team to be successful, you have to have a common goal. You have to be working towards that everybody is working towards. And if you aren't aligned as a team, then you're going to end up working against each other for resources, for time, whatever it is, and then no one's going to win really important when you're coming together as a team to be really clear about what is that common goal that we're all going to work towards and then what are the roles that everyone's going to play in order to help us achieve that common goal.
not fighting with each other, but working together. You know, going back to the, the five dysfunctions, the ability to discuss conflict in a positive way and, and not take it personally and not go into the emotional fight, flight, or freeze. Any comments about that? Coming to an accord, it's not all going to be full agreement, nor should it be. Yes, that's true. You have to be able to disagree, but respectfully disagree with each other and, and just to be open and honest because it's not all about just agreement. I'm not saying that you have to do this with all teams, but I have been on teams where we've created almost team contracts that we've all kind of signed, worked on, come together with, and been signed in terms of how we commit to working together. And so I think it's important to understand that, you know, it's not just about everybody agreeing with each other. It's being respectful in your communications, being open and honest, being willing to tell people when you disagree with them in a respectful way and being open to that feedback and receptive to that feedback as well. Having those conversations, even if it's not documented, having those conversations up front, if it's a new team coming together about how you're going to work together, what's acceptable behavior and what's not, that can be really really useful for the team up front. What about the individual who joins the team, just like the example you gave, it doesn't go well, but then they have that a moment where they realize it hasn't gone well, it's not effective. Is it possible if it doesn't go well to change the dynamic and making it go well? And if so, how do you do that? If, if you are that person and you just haven't been accepted based on your behavior or whatever, what, what, what is your thoughts and experiences? It obviously depends on how on the relationships and how, how much damage has been done in those relationships in the amount of time, whether it can be saved. I do think for the most part, it can be as long as it's not been, you know, years and years of, of this behavior. So I do think that you can change it. I think it's really helpful to have that advocate, to find that advocate on the team that is going to, in a sense, champion you with the rest of the team, help you mend those fences and build bridges. If that relationship, if you understand that that relationship is not working or has been damaged, it's getting feedback. Going to your manager to understand what the feedback is, and even talking to the team members to understand what's going on, if you can, um, to really understand what some of those challenges are so that you can figure out how to address them, how to maybe change some of your behaviors or clarify why you're doing what you're doing. I wonder if you have the same experience that there's almost two types of people that try and, and do the corrective ones, the ones that verbally say they didn't do well. And then the other ones that just say, okay, I'm going to try and reintegrate. And, and then I found the ones that have that humility tend to do better. Have you found that as well or, or not? Yes. I think that if you have that humility and if you're willing to own your mistakes and learn from them, that people are more open to that and they're more receptive to you. If you go into it just saying, this wasn't my fault, it was the team, you're not going to solve the situation. <laughs> you might as well just move on to the next team. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and just say if you, if you were starting a, a new team soon and, and you, you've given so many ideas about, okay, well, this is how I set myself up for success. What are the few things that you'd really focus on to join that new team? It would be really important to do some research on the people that are going to be on the team. So whether that going on to LinkedIn or connecting with other individuals in your network, internally, externally, to learn more about the people on the team, getting an understanding for those individuals, for their motivation, coming up with some key questions and some key activities. Like what do you, what key actions do you want to take in the, in the very beginning to help you get to know these people and to help build relationships within the team? Active listening is so critical when you're joining a team. So thinking about that, remembering, it, especially if you're joining a team that's already together, I want to go in there and listen more than you're speaking at least in the beginning, to really understand what's going on on that team. Trying to get as much information up front as you can about what those individuals are like, maybe how the team's perceived in the organization, and figuring out how your strengths, you've obviously been put, you're being put on that team for a reason. So how can you leverage the strengths that you're bringing in to, to help this team succeed? 
That's a great list of set yourself up for success activities to do it. And, and, and thank goodness for LinkedIn. That we, can, we can actually yeah. see most people and say, oh my goodness, <laughs> you, know, we, you went to high school with my friend or whatever it is that you can make that connection. Right. And in the spirit of change on the run where people are just going so quickly, and if you only had time to do one thing, so it's that forced choice, that one thing to join a team that would give you 80% of the results in 20% of the time, what would that one thing B. I would say find their why. It's like what Simon Sinek says about great companies. This is important to understand what drives people. What are their motivations? Because once you understand their motivations, you can then figure out how you can use your talent to help them, to support them, and ultimately it's going to achieve both of your needs. And I think that also going to help you in getting to know the people, to understand them, to build those relationships and to gain trust, to find their why. Such a great answer for so many things in, in business. If you find what motivates people and you can connect into that, you've already have an accord that you can build upon. As we close off the show, do you have an insight or a watch out or a tip that you'd like to share with the listeners that could help them be successful? Yeah, I think with the changes that we've all been experiencing with the pandemic in terms of how we work together, it's more challenging and more critical than ever that we connect with our teams, especially in this virtual world. We are missing that face-to-face, in-person time, and so we need to find a way to maintain that virtually. Jennifer, thanks so much for being on the show. How can people get in contact with you? The best way for people to get in touch with me is is through LinkedIn, or you can also email me at uh, jwaxman at mcleanco.com. Fantastic. And we'll make sure that those two contact points are in the show notes. And thanks again for being on the show and to everyone for listening. And if you're interested in receiving more episodes every two weeks, please hit the subscribe button or leave a comment to let us know what you think. And until the next time, I wish you all the best as you continue to lead change.